So good afternoon and welcome back from the break. I'm Kevin Elsie, a program analyst from Advanced Simulation and Computing at the National Nuclear Security Administration, and I'll be your moderator for the next four sessions of the day. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Peter Lawler, who is studying nuclear engineering at MIT under advisor Eric Danagulian. He completed his practicum at Los Alamos National Lab in 2021, so welcome, Peter. All right, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed your break and are ready for another round of talks. I'm Peter from MIT. Today, I'll be talking about reconstructing the atomic number of cargo X-ray images using dual energy radiography. So first, let's do a brief history. In 2006, US Congress passed the Safe Port Act. In this act, they required scanning 100% of US-bound cargo containers prior to US entry. This was a big, ambitious piece of legislation. It had tremendous nuclear security objectives. They were going to search cargo containers for nuclear materials, 100% of cargoes prior to US entry. In 2007, US Congress passed the 9-11 Commission Act, which amended the Safe Port Act, and it said this provision is applicable beginning in 2012. So beginning in 2012, 100% of cargo containers are going to be scanned prior to US entry. In 2012, the Department of Homeland Security Secretary requests a two-year extension, citing technological limitations. In 2014, <laughs> the DHS Secretary requests a two-year extension, citing technological limitations. In 2016, OK, I, 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 think, I think you know where I'm going with this. Um, <laughs> In 2022, the DHS Secretary requests a two-year extension, and that brings us to where we are today. So 17 years since the Safe Port Act was initially passed, we still are not at the goal of 100% scanning of US-bound cargo containers prior to US entry. So why is that? Why is this requirement so elusive? In 2015, the Congressional Budget Office put out a report where they asked how expensive would it be to equip 453 ports all around the world with the scanning technology required in order to scan 100% of cargo, cargo containers, they found that installational, installation and operational costs would be in the range of 22 to $32 billion. So this is obviously very expensive and cost prohibitive. And in order to convince the government to spend $30 billion on scanners, we have to be sure they work. So this brings us to a research overview. Uh, in order to realistically implement scanning systems at 453 ports all around the world, we have to be confident that these systems have a high detection rate of nuclear materials and a low false alarm rate. Currently, these uh, scans are manually reviewed by port operators, which introduces the possibility of human error, and it also suggests that there's room for improvement using automated image analysis techniques. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today is how we can assist port assist port operators by predicting the material composition of these images of cargo containers, which would enhance the ability to identify nuclear or radiological materials which might be hidden inside these containers. So here's a picture of what these systems look like. You have a photon source that generates an X-ray beam. This beam is shaped into a fan beam and passes through a cargo container. There's a stack of detectors on the far side of the cargo container, which measures the photon beam. Then the cargo container drives through the beam, and that's how you produce this 2D density image of the container. So this lets you look inside the container, see what's going on without needing to manually unload and inspect the container. Here's a cartoon diagram of the same thing, what's going on, photon beam through a cargo container measured by a stack of detectors. What I want to talk to you about this slide is the idea of a photon beam transparency. That's what the detectors are actually measuring, is the transparency of a photon beam. So if the transparency is one, that means no attenuation, so that would be no cargo container. Transparency of zero, total attenuation, this would mean a large, thick cargo container. So I talked to you earlier about using these systems to predict the material composition or the atomic number of materials inside the cargo container. How do we do that? We do that through dual energy technology. So the motivation is that the photon beam transparency that the detectors measure depends on two things. It depends on the area density of the content, so the thickness, 
and it depends on the atomic number of the material. So different elements will attenuate the photon beam differently. So we have two unknowns. What if we make two measurements using different photon energy spectra? So we have a high energy measurement and a low energy measurement. This gives us two measurements for two unknowns. In principle, we could solve that system, infer the atomic number. That would be very useful for identifying illicit materials that might be hidden inside cargo. How is this done today? Currently, uh, atomic number reconstruction is done empirically. So what this means is for different calibration materials, uh, you measure their transparencies, you repeat this for different thicknesses, and you obtain, this is obviously very simplified, but a database that looks similar to this, uh, an empirical database of calibration scans for known materials. Then if you want to predict the identity of an unknown material, you measure its transparency, you look where in this table do I find this transparency. In this simple case, this would correspond to iron. So this is today at ports, the general framework of how this problem is solved is using this empirical approach. Now this approach has some obvious downsides. The first is that it requires a large amount of calibration data. You have to use several different calibration materials and a range of thicknesses for every material in order to build these uh, lookup tables. And second, it's unclear how to extrapolate to materials which aren't included in the calibration step. And in practice, no extrapolation is done. Instead, you define broad Z bins, and whenever you introduce binning into your algorithm, you're losing potential accuracy. So one way to go about this is to instead invert an analytic model. So we write the transparency as the detected charge in the presence of a cargo container, normalized by the open beam measurement. We can inject our knowledge of physics and say that the detected charge we can write as the number of original photons times the probability each photon reaches the detector times the detected charge per photon. We can approximate the number of original photons using beam simulations. We can approximate the detected charge per photon using detector response simulations. And we can write that the probability a photon reaches the detector is an exponential dependence on the mass attenuation coefficient. So that's what mu is, it's the mass attenuation coefficient. It says how likely is a photon to interact with a material. It depends on the photon energy. It also depends on the atomic number of the material. If you combine everything together, you get a relatively compact equation. So this is your forward model. This is for a material of aerial density lambda and atomic number z, what would I expect to measure? And then you solve the inverse problem. You invert the system and you back infer what materials most likely gave a set of measured transparencies. So this sounds great in principle. It solves all the problems I talked about before. You don't have to do any calibration because it's an analytic model. Um, and the function is continuous in Z, which means you have no extrapolation uncertainty. However, the analytic model doesn't work very well. So what this plot is, I don't want you to pay too much attention to the axes. What I want, you, what I want to point your attention to is that um, the error bars correspond to simulation output, and the dashed lines correspond to model predictions. And every line corresponds to different elements. So that's what the color bar shows is different elements. And obviously, you can see that the model does not accurately predict the simulation output, which is important because if your model is inaccurate and you predict incorrect transparencies, when you invert the model, you're going to get incorrect material predictions. So this is why this framework isn't actually what's used at ports today, is because even though it has all sorts of nice properties, it makes incorrect material predictions, which makes it relatively useless at the end of the day. So this work, how can we improve the accuracy of the analytic model? Um, in particular, can we combine the empirical approach with the analytic approach to get the accuracy of the empirical approach with the mathematical convenience of the analytic model. And the way I do that is by expanding the mass attenuation coefficient into three different components. So photons are most likely to interact either via the photoelectric effect, so absorption, um, Compton scattering, where a photon scatters off of an electron, or pair production, where a photon splits into an electron and a positron. Each of those have an associated mass attenuation coefficient, which sum to make the total mass attenuation coefficient. What we can then do is introduce these three scaling parameters to scale the relative probability of interaction via the photoelectric effect, Compton scattering, and pair production. And there is some physical intuition as to why you might want to do this. The effect is that it gives us different knobs that we can turn 
which can in turn tweak the analytic model, which using empirical data might let us fit the uh, simulation output. So here's the results doing this. The left is the same plot you saw earlier using the analytic model. The right, after a relatively simple calibration step where we determine what values to use for these parameters, we're able to fit the empirical data quite a bit better, which is exciting because this tells us that we can use this analytic framework to make material predictions and trust that the material predictions are going to be accurate. So to validate this, I ran a simulation study. Here is a steel cargo container, and I put different materials inside the container. Um, ran Monte Carlo simulations in JANT4, and I asked the research question, can I predict what materials are present in the container? Here I want to take a second to talk about the importance of high-performance computing in this research. These are very high-flux systems, around 10 million photons per second per detector. Furthermore, the container is moving, which means you have to run a different set of simulations for every vertical slice in the container, so access to HPC resources has been very valuable for obtaining realistic simulation outputs. Here's what this looks like. On the right, you see a plot of what the simulation output is. You can obviously see the different objects in the uh, image. Uh, the noise has been added to make it representative of realistic images. Uh, the atomic number reconstruction algorithm is laid out as follows. Uh, you run an image segmentation routine to identify uh, different regions in the container. Then for each region, you define a chi-squared objective function, which quantifies how well does my model match the simulated transparency measurements. And then you minimize chi-squared. You find what atomic number minimizes chi-squared, and that is what I'm going to assign as the atomic number prediction for that region in the container. So the results look quite good. So the left is the ground truth atomic number of this simulated radiograph. I know that because obviously I know what image, what objects I put inside the container. The right is the output of the framework that I described previously. And you can see by the color bar, which denotes the atomic number, that the reconstructed Z quite accurately matches the ground truth. No plot would be useful without an associated uncertainty estimate. So that's what I'm showing here. The color bar identifies the uncertainty in the reconstructed Z of every pixel. The methodology for doing this was generating a large number of noisy images, running the same algorithm on all of them, and looking how much does my predicted Z change between different runs. And what you can see is that the uncertainty is in the low single digits, which is exciting because this is smaller than the bin sizes of prior work, which means here is a more precise atomic number reconstruction routine, which we can apply to images in order to assist port operators in the identification of nuclear or radiological materials, which might be hidden inside cargo containers. This is my conclusion slide. I'm not going to read them to you. Instead, I'm going to thank you for listening and invite any questions.